Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Courageous Conversations about our schools. This is your host, Ken Fiedernick. And my guest today is Daniel Buck. Daniel recently published an article that caught my attention. It's titled, In Defense of the Culture Wars in Education. If you're familiar with this podcast, you know it's about defusing the culture wars. You know the the underlying premise for my show is that the culture wars are bad, not good for schools. They're bad for students and bad for our democracy. And if you search for culture wars and school board meetings on YouTube, you will find loads of videos where people are yelling at their elected officials, calling them and teachers vile names, making serious allegations about the harm they are doing to children. Here's just a, a sampling of what you might hear if you were to go to YouTube and listen to some of these board meetings. Ladies and gentlemen, we must have order to proceed. And if we don't have order, we're going to recess the hearing again. Well, no, Attorney Senate is going to respect the parents in this room. We know who you are. No more Figure it out or get off the podium. Because you know what? There are people like me and a line of other people out there who will gladly take your seat and figure it out. Sir, your time is finished. Can you please leave the boardroom? It's okay. Don't worry Thank you. I'll be back next time and the next time to you open the freaking school. Can I ask the deputy to please make sure the gentleman had leaves the boardroom? So you can imagine how intrigued I was when I came across Daniel's piece, seemingly taking the opposite position from mine. And it's why reached out to Daniel to see if he'd join me on this podcast. And lo and behold, he agreed. So, uh, Daniel, welcome to Courageous Conversations about our schools. Yeah, glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Tell our listeners about yourself a little bit, um, where you live, what you do, and and who you work for. I live in good old Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, I taught for seven years because of my wife's job. We kind of moved around. So I taught at four different schools in seven years. And I was at uh, public, private, religious, secular, choice-founded, affluent, poor school. Like, I've, I've seen it all at this point. Um, there were some definite cons to moving around that much. Uh, you know, it's nice to be at one job for a long time. But now that I do commentary full-time, it's actually been kind of um, a benefit because I've seen a little bit of everything. If we're talking about private schools, oh, I kind of know what goes on there. If we're talking about public schools, oh, I know, I kind of know what goes on there. And right now, um, I shifted to working full time for the Fordham Institute and their kind of um, research and policy shop based out of Washington, D.C. I work remotely for them. Uh, I do a smattering of different things for them. We're a pretty, pretty small organization, so we all wear a lot of different hats, but primarily uh, I help on the editorial and policy side, and then just, you know, I'm kind of like a staff writer, writing columns for them, writing columns to pitch elsewhere, uh, drawing the small straw every time we have to do annual reports or anything like that. I'm the guy that drafts a lot of that stuff up. I'm just a staff writer, basically. Um, and does Fordham primarily focus on uh, education matters, or is it broader than that? They do exclusively education. Oh, okay. Yeah. And and when you taught Daniel, what did you teach? I taught uh, both English and English as a second language, mostly at the middle school level, but I did some high school in there too. Yeah. Okay. Great. Well, let's um, let, let's jump right into it. I, I would love for you to to just summarize for our listeners and for me the um, the the case you make, uh, sort of defending the the culture wars in education. I'm Intrigued, I think our listeners will be too. Is why would why would someone want to promote uh, uh, or defend the culture wars? So tell us why you uh, why you uh, you promoted that and why you're defending it. I wrote the piece because it was just such a pet peeve of mine, and I found myself so irked over and again seeing media journalists advocates complain about the culture wars their distraction the culture wars are distracting us from doing what works in education and all of these kinds of things uh i just grew tired of reading the culture wars so to speak um 
grew tired of seeing them denigrated and um, downplayed and devalued. Uh, in the piece that I wrote for the Fordham Institute, I make three points that they're important, popular, and inevitable. So the important part, um, you know, if you look at what people, uh, opinion writers, whoever tend to call the culture wars in modern education, you'll see, well, the book bans or arguments over um, history curriculum or arguments over, you know, how we define gender in schools and what we're going to teach our kids in their sex ed classes. You ask me, those are pretty like wildly consequential debates. How are we going to frame American history and uh, teach our the next generation about our country and what it did well or poorly? That's a big deal. How do we define manhood and womanhood? Are we going to, um, you know, break down this institutional definition that we've had for generations? Maybe, but like, can we talk about that? Can we argue about that a little bit? Uh, what books are we going to read with our children? Um, I make the second point that they're popular. When you read about, you know, somebody like Ron DeSantis in the media, you'll see, oh, he's a, a, a divisive character or a divisive politician. He's um, putting a wedge between uh, schools and parents. I mean, he won Florida by a 20 point margin. I know he didn't have much success at the presidential level, but in his own home state, he was popular among um, Republicans and Democrats, uh, his school policies, when you actually broke down the language in them, um, even 55% of Democrats supported him. Uh, testing, controversial. Um, funding for schools, pretty controversial. I don't want teachers to read books about sex with kids. That's actually a pretty popular policy. Um, and then my third point is that they're, they're, inevitable, these culture wars. Uh, our schools are public institutions, and we are bringing together hundreds and thousands of kids and families all under the same roof, and then making decisions about how we're going to educate those kids. Like, fights are going to erupt there, and disagreements are going to erupt there. In Federalist 10, uh, the authors argue that factionalism is basically inherent in human nature. There are so many different um, opinions and personal interests that when you bring people together, they're going to come into conflict. Um, and the only way to get rid of that conflict is either um, make everyone agree, which is never going to happen, or have one party basically dominate the other, one faction dominate the other, which is oppressive and unjust. So the case that I make in the article is that the culture wars are important, they're popular, and they're inevitable. How, how'd I do? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's terrific. I just, uh, you, you summed it up nicely. And and, um, and and if I were just to loop back and, and make sure that I understand you, what your, what your case is, that these, um, there are conversations that need to happen. They're important conversations that are just as important as the things that we typically talk about uh, when it comes to testing or uh, curriculum and the the, uh, the usual things that come up in our our conversations, but there are these larger issues that have to do with what kids, uh, what our curriculum consists of, and um, when it's appropriate to talk about uh, you know matters of race or you know how we how we treat history, and those are really big questions and and they they need to we need to have conversations about that. that's the important part the the popular part is that um a lot of people uh, recently have gotten uh engaged maybe people that weren't engaged in these conversations before so they're they're popular and that's a in in your view an indication of why they're important to have um and then third um you know i i would I think what I interpreted from what you're saying is that we live in a, a pluralistic society, democratic society, people with all kinds of views about virtually everything. And when it comes to schools, why would it be any different? And uh, and therefore, conversations about what kids learn, how, when they learn it, and so forth, th 
those conversations or those conflicts are inevitable. And so I, I think what you're saying is it's best not to avoid them, but to, to embrace them and not to say that they're, did I, did I get that pretty close to yep, uh, being say, accurate? You did a, you did a very well job of summarizing <laughs> what I said. All right. Um, so I, I'm intrigued by this because I, I, I have a feeling that uh, it may turn out that we don't disagree as much as one might think just based on the intro I did and the title of your article and what I said about what I'm doing. But let me um, let me take a moment to just summarize my position on the culture wars and and why I I say that I'm against them. And then and then you 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 feel free to ask me questions and I have a few that I want to ask you and we'll see if we end up agreeing on some things or, or disagreeing on some things. I guess I would start, Daniel, by saying that I, I don't often see much good coming from war, any kind of war, generally speaking. Um, I think there, there are a something that has been done historically as a last resort. And there's certainly been a, an awful lot of bad wars with really bad consequences. But I think if we were to think of the you know War of Independence, the Second World War, uh, the Civil War, those were things that occurred uh, with a lot of casualties, of course, but it's, it's kind of a last resort. And um, I think some might argue that good things came of that. But I think that my, my feelings are generally bad and the casualties usually are, are much uh, greater than the benefits. Um, when it comes to culture wars and education, I I, I worry about the uh, when the gloves come off and people communicate their concerns about issues around things like the books kids have access to or how we talk to kids about gender and sexual identity or race and so forth. But they um, people say some pretty terrible things, you know, a lot of name calling and um, sort of, you know, vile terms. Uh, I, I think of a teacher in Florida who uh, had her students in an earth science class view a Disney movie uh, called Strange World that had content related to earth science, but it happened, it was an animated show and it included a gay character and she got a lot of grief, was called a pedophile and a groomer, and um, and she ended up quitting, um, like many teachers during these culture wars have have done because the the level of discourse, the kind of conversations we have, the names that are thrown about, and the accusations are made are, are not what people that uh, get elected to school boards or or sign up to be a teacher or administrator necessarily signed up for. Um, also, and again, this is my definition of a culture war, and maybe not yours, but when we attack and shame people on the other side, it, it I've never seen a case where it convinces people to change their minds or even to open up to a, a position that's different than their own or to or to compromise. And in fact, it it usually only emboldens people on each side to dig in their heels uh, more than they already have. And so it doesn't lead to any kind of common ground. And um, I, an another concern I have is that um, is that I think as adults uh, in schools, uh, you know, at school board meetings where these things play out or in social media or on the media, our kids are watching. And I, I worry about what they're learning uh, in terms of how we uh, approach our differences and in, in the names that we use and uh, the accusations that we're making and the, the contempt that, that people feel towards each other. And I, I just... I wince when I think of what kids are learning about how adults are attempting to resolve their differences. And and I guess the last thing I would say is, I guess two things. One is when relationships among parents and educators and school board members become, uh, when there's complete loss of trust and relationships get so frayed, it's hard for people to work together, even in areas where they do agree. It's like we we're not going to you know let's agree to dis or agree to disagree on that, but let's get back and talk about a really serious problem like 
absenteeism is something I'm really concerned about. Post pandemic, there are the schools that I'm uh, aware of that uh, where chronic absenteeism is close to 50%. Those are kids that aren't coming to school at least 10% of the time. And, and uh, half of the kids in a school are, are staying at home. Uh, and so to solve that really serious problem, it requires all of us to come together in the community, parents and educators say, how are we going to solve that problem, which we all have to agree is a serious problem. But if our if we've decided we are suspicious of other people or we hate those people or we don't want anything to do with them, then it makes it hard for us to come together and do that. And, and, and I guess finally, um, I worry in a profession where most schools in the country struggle to get enough dedicated, qualified people to come and work, that it's driving people away. Uh, they don't want to be part of, prof of a profession where the, these kinds of things are happening and there's so much mistrust um, that they leave. And then it ultimately has, uh, that has a negative effect on, um, on kids. And um, what I will end with is just saying that I'm strongly in favor, and this is where you and I might find some common ground, uh, it's strongly in favor of healthy conflict. Uh, having you re just referred to them as debates. And, and and I think there's an opportunity there to find common ground. But in healthy conflict, I think all sides are trying to understand the issues. They're looking for solutions. They're not simply trying to get their way. You know, in issues like gender and sexual identity, how history is taught, those are complicated topics. And I think they require that we begin by listening to each other doing what you suggested we do with uh, culture wars is to define what we mean and then have people agree to listen, to be civil and not to attack and shame one another, but to be open to different perspectives. And I think that's, I think if we all thought about it, we would want to model that for our children, for the next generation, that that they would engage in their differences in that way, so that's that's there's my uh, that's my rationale for what what I'm doing, and I'm just curious to to hear your thoughts about what uh, what I just put out there. I think you know, uh, guiding principle for me is be slow to anger, slow to speak, and quick to listen. That doesn't mean never anger, never speak, and always listen. I think you should always listen. Um, but that that verse from scripture is often thrown out as a reason to never be angry, but that's not the case. Um, it sounds like that teacher in Florida who quit because they were called a pedophile. That was an unfitting accusation. It was unjustified anger. It was a well-meaning teacher who showed a video and parents overreacted. A lot of times, um, you, if you look at my own social media, on Twitter or Facebook or wherever it is, uh, I kind of have a rule for myself that I will never attack somebody directly um, and I will only attack ideas. I'll mock ideas. If an idea is dumb or stupid, I'll say so. Um, I think a lot of bad ideas proliferate in education because there are so many people that say like, oh, well, let's try to understand this. What can we take out of something like learning styles? when the appropriate response is learning styles is pseudoscientific, um, it is doing harm to our students. And the sooner we throw in the trash bin, the better, period. Um, let's focus on, you know, effective instruction, not trying to understand an idea that's been disproven for decades. Uh, so I will be rather forceful in my rhetoric about that I will never attack people. At the same time, and this is, I'm kind of the following ideas that I'm going to express. I'm not even sure if I agree with them necessarily, but just for the sake of discussion, I'm going to put them out there and see what you think about them. You know, maybe there is a time and a place to name call, so to speak. You know, you want to call, um, call a fish a fish. I think Winston Churchill is an example where um, sometimes anger and name calling have a place. And I think we should be very careful of when we employ that. Uh, but from an 
ethical approach, I'm not going to say we should absolutely never, ever, 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 ever name call or go to anger. We should just be careful when we do and make sure it's fitting to the situation. And we're calling evil, evil. We try to move beyond the words good and evil. We lose language that we need to describe um, horrible acts in this world. And then there's also kind of a pragmatic um angle to it too just how are we going to accomplish the goals that we want and that one i'm unsure about um you know is it even if it might be right to call somebody evil or wicked or whatever you know call a pedophile a pedophile if they're a pedophile but is that actually going to be productive in a, a political or policy making sense yeah yeah um, i'm glad you, you brought up the practical part because that's just what i was going to ask you about is there's you know i guess there's one thing is it is it ethically defensible to to name call and i guess it depends on the name and whether there's justification for doing it but i'm interested in the 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 practical implications of our calling each other names even if they are accurate i guess and um and i i go back to something i said earlier that i i i and I would like you to see if you can give me an example of a of a culture war where people were attacking each other that resulted in, uh, you know, some reason to believe that the schools benefited or students benefited uh, through a culture war where people were uh, attacking each other or holding one another in contempt uh, or name calling. I think there are plenty of examples where conservatives kind of uh, gave up ground on um, important policies because they weren't fighting the culture war. We talk about um, school board members who are saying, you know, this isn't what I signed up for. Uh, and I've heard a lot of people make that comment. And my, you know, the snarky little um, provocateur in the back of my head says, oh, so like, you want to return to a time when seven out of 10 school board members were won by the union backed candidate and conservatives just sat in their corner and let whatever the the union backed school board wanted to happen happen. Uh, I think for a long time, conservatives just didn't fight the culture war. What came through in your article and then again just now is this idea that there are there are two possibilities in terms of the way we engage with each other. And I, let me just check this out with you to see if, if if I'm hearing you correctly. And one option is for us to is to fight, sort of take the gloves off, do whatever it takes to to make sure you have a voice and and to listen to, but uh is to just embrace the uh the conflict. Uh that it may be hard and ugly at times, but it's sort of a necessary thing to do to make sure everyone's voice, everyone has a voice and people aren't excluded. Or the second option is that, um, as you say, there's, there's sort of kumbaya stuff where we just agree to be nice and we stay away from the conflict, uh, which, uh, which is not a good thing because we're avoiding really important subjects where uh, we should be having conversations. Um, so I, 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 that's what I, I mean, you cited uh, James Madison, who sort of made mm -hmm. the same point that, you know, we can either uh, avoid each other altogether uh, or we can and, and stay away from these things or we can jump in and have conflict about this. But I, I think what I want to, what I'm trying to do with my podcast, what I'm trying to do personally is to to have these conversations not in a kumbaya way where we're just simply kind for the sake of being kind, but so we can better understand the problems and try to find common ground, uh, to sometimes find compromises. And sometimes we'll end up just uh, disagreeing and we'll agree to disagree and, and continue to respect and treat each other humanely so that when the next hour we have to work together on some other problem where we do agree, like reducing absenteeism, uh, we don't hate each other. Mm -hmm. And we can say, yeah, let's, uh, let, Daniel, let's, let's put that aside and let's come back and keep talking about that. 
but uh, we've got to we've got to figure out how to get more kids into school because they're not going to learn if they're not in school. Um, so I'm proposing, I think, a, a third way uh, rather than just no holds barred conflict, anything goes. Uh, on the one hand, and and the sort of kumbaya, kumbaya, let's just avoid uh, conflict altogether and just be nice to each other. But a third way that, in the way that I just described, I think there are policies that can also help accomplish that goal. When we federalize a lot of our debates, I mean, some of them, some issues have to be at the federal level. Um, foreign affairs, interstate commerce, those kinds of things, those almost by necessity have to, to be run by the federal government. But um, James Madison, you know, again, points out that factions and arguments are inevitable. I would say they're kind of a good thing. I enjoy them. Um, that's why I do what I do. But when we push policies at the federal level, you're getting, you know, a blue haired Californian and a big buckled Texan trying to get them to agree on one policy, good luck. Uh, maybe there's a, a panel moderator skilled enough to bring something productive out of that. Uh, but a way to turn down the heat is to keep a lot of these debates at the local level, subsidiarity. Um, it's much easier to get neighbors um, to have civil debates because, you know, we have each other over for dinner. We say hi to each other as we're going out for a car in the morning, that kind of thing. Uh, and then another policy would be um, school choice. I honestly, as, as a libertarian leaning conservative, I actually have my reservations with school choice. I've written about it before, but I think it is one way to turn, tone down some of the heat if you're getting people to opt in to the school that they want to go to, even, you know, um, staying in place and just going to a local public school is still a choice. But if you're getting people uh, opting into a classical school or pro a progressive school or a project based learning or a religious school, a military, whatever it is, military academy, there's going to be uh, more shared first principles that will um allow compromise and allow healthier debates than trying to bring together a doctrinaire Christian and a doctrinaire atheist with incompatible first principles and say, all right, agree how to educate your children. <laughs> Good luck. Yeah. And you, you know, you talked you know, about uh, healthy debate and turning down the volume. Those are things that I really embrace. And I have to say um, what has been, uh, gratifying in doing this podcast is that I deliberately go out and find that, you know, conservative person from Texas and a and a liberal leaning person from California, not necessarily those states, although I, I've had many from those states. Um, but I think about uh, our last podcast episode, which focused on homeschooling, and I had a, a conservative, conservative lawmaker, homeschooling parent from Maine, uh, who is it, who conceded this is homeschooling is not for everybody. It was it was for my kids. It was a great thing, and then she heard stories from people who had been homeschooled uh, on the same call who described a homeschooling experiences that um, that really uh, in sort of in the name of parental rights. Uh, and one from Texas, where the parents can do virtually anything they want as homeschooling parents, no accountability, no restrictions. And when this woman lawmaker, conservative person from uh, from Maine heard their stories and or, uh, from Texas, and then uh, one other story about a woman whose parents told her that she wasn't learning mathematics because A, girls couldn't learn mathematics, they didn't have the mind for it and would never need it. Um, and, and this, uh, Lawmaker said, my heart goes out to you. This is heart-wrenching stories. And we have to find, you know, guardrails to make sure that that doesn't happen. Um, so here was here was a group of people uh, across the political spectrum listening to each other, hearing their personal stories, having some empathy for what people 
had gone through and saying, I, I have to think about that. There's got to, we've got to find a way to ensure that what happened to you and other people in situations like that don't happen. And I don't know that she knew what the answer was, but at least, at least we, the conversations were civil. There was some empathy expressed both ways. And, um, and, and I think if the conversation continued uh, and we said, what sort of policies, if any, should we develop to ensure that uh, the experiences of these two people aren't replicated uh, with many more? So I think people, and I, I just want to say one one thing about a, uh, a person I've had on as a guest, Amanda Ripley, who's written a book called High Conflict and How We Get Trapped and How We Get Out. She says there's a, a paradox when it comes to high toxic conflict. And she says, on the one hand, we're we're drawn to it. And, and it sort of goes to your point about they're popular. And she would say, yeah, they are. Um, uh, you know, our cable news networks um, benefit a, a lot by conflict, uh, this high conflict and uh, sort of the, the Jerry Springer shows of the world. People are drawn to it. But the paradox is that most of us are also haunted by it, she says, that that if we can find a way not to do it and find a way to come together and listen and be respectful uh, and sometimes agree to disagree, that we'll also want to go in that direction too. And that's what I'm finding in this podcast is that people who have very different perspectives, different ends of the ideological political spectrum, if we agree to come in together and we're going to be respectful, uh, people say, yeah, I, I want to do that. Uh, I'm, I'm tired of the... Uh, of this toxic conversations. Um, you know, Peter Coleman says that there's like somewhere close to 66% of Americans polled about toxic conflicts say they they don't like it and they consider themselves part of this sort of uh, exhausted majority saying, this isn't good for me personally, it's not good for my country. And, and if there's another way to do it, I want to hear about it. Mm -hmm. And I think as you began this conversation, that there's um, more agreement between us than uh, at first meets the eye. You know, I got you to concede. I think you, I didn't get you to concede. You, to some extent, conceded in the beginning that even a few wars throughout history have been justified. One, two, three, horrible consequences, horrible losses. But most people agree in the grand scheme of things, you know, the Civil War or World War II awful yeah what i i guess I, I go back to the question i posed earlier is can you imagine a case in, you know at the local level uh, where schools are trying to figure out what books are appropriate to have in a school library or what uh, how should we talk about gender and sexual identity and you know you said earlier you know you don't you don't want kids young kids being taught about gender and, and uh sexual identity and i but the the even that conversation gets a little bit nuanced and tricky when I pose this question to some of my the people that I have on the show, which is, you know, suppose you're a, a child who has two moms or two dads and they come into class and someone says, wait a minute, how I don't how do you have two moms? I I just have one or I, I didn't think everyone people have a mom and a dad. And so a teacher can say, I'm oh, sorry, we're not going to talk about that. In which case, the kid with two moms or two dads might feel uh, there's something wrong with me. I don't belong. It's abnormal uh, for a teacher to say, I'm sorry, we can't talk about that. But in, with some of the new laws being passed and that are that are pretty vague, uh, teachers are kind of throwing their hands up and wondering what to do. Can I put a picture of myself and my the male teacher? And, and just like many teachers would do, here's a picture of my family. But... Um, I'm married to a man. This is my husband. Can I talk about that? And if kids say, wait a minute, you're married to a man, you know, not that you would teach about it other than to say, yes, I, this is, this is my family. And there are other families that have similar arrangements. Um, you're not teaching them about sexuality or gender identity. You're just acknowledging what is the case, which is in fact, legal now in this country. And it is the way that some families exist. And you're just wanting to make sure that 
nobody feels that there there's something wrong with that because we say nobody can't talk about that uh i think there are no laws that have been passed that would you know limit a teacher from acknowledging that they're married to um somebody of the same sex or acknowledging that some kids have um two moms or two dads anyone any news story that insinuates otherwise is spreading fake news uh and i also think it's pretty easy for a teacher to say some families have a mom and dad some families have two moms some families have two dads today we're talking about algebraic equations end of the story mm -hmm. um ask you want to know more ask your parents about it uh, if, if, if we want to do uh, tough cases, there was the uh, story of a father, I believe it was in Montgomery County. I'd have to, I'd have to double check where it happened. Um, you know, photos of him being dragged out screaming at a school board um, meeting because his daughter had been assaulted in a bathroom by somebody of the opposite biological sex who believed that they were, you know, the different gender. And the board continued to sweep it under the rug and try to ignore it. And he didn't get his, you know, day in public court until he went and caused a ruckus. Should he just sit down and play nice and play kumbaya when his daughter was assaulted in the bathroom? I don't think so. Yeah, that's a, that, there's a case. I mean, there's a, a alleged criminal act, uh, and but I don't. I, that's not a cultural war issue, is it? I mean, that that if if they were ignoring a crime and sweeping it under the rug, that's just that terrible. It shouldn't happen. And that's if I was a parent and that happened to my kid, I'd be doing the same thing. I would do everything I could to make sure justice was served. But, you know, we're talking about books that have, uh, this gets a little more nuanced, uh, or the movie that Jenna Barbie, this teacher in Florida, showed, uh, a Disney movie that happened to have an animated gay character, just someone expressed having sort of a crush on another teenager of the same sex. You know, parents came in and said, you're a groomer. They just... Uh, they called her names, and the heat got so high, the vitriol was so great that she quit. And so there was no conversation about that. And you know, and and, and you wonder what kids in that class and kids in that school that heard about that are thinking. Wait a minute, what's so wrong with a teenager in a Disney movie who's expressing? their attraction to someone of the same gender? There's no teaching about it. We're not promoting it or criticizing it it just was a character and and a lot of books are being pulled from shelves because of depictions of not of sexuality but just of people of the same gender who are attracted to each other and on the flip side again the harder cases in response uh, if somebody read with my daughter the book gender queer and people aren't contesting gender queer because it's um depicting uh same sex attraction people are contesting gender gender queer because there are grotesquely explicit images in there i don't even want to describe them on this mm. podcast when parents have read them out loud at school board meetings their mics are cut off because they're too graphic and you know it's kind of one of the ploys that a lot of the uh parent activists do is they go up there, they read these books, they get their mic shut off and they say like, if I can't read it here, why are you reading it with my child? But if somebody read one of those books with my kid and they quit or they got fired, good. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I want to bring this to a close on. I, I, I really want to thank you for being part of the podcast, but just um, can you share a takeaway, any takeaways you've had from our conversation about the substance of it and and also the way we had it as we're concluding i'm just thinking about how much of this seems to be where are you familiar with the term the overton window uh, this phrase to describe basically what's considered um acceptable uh what's considered acceptable to debate i enjoy having contentious 
civil conversations. Um, in college, one of my best friends was, you know, a progressive atheist socialist, and we'd go for long runs together for two hours. We'd go for a run. We were both marathoners and just argue. And we'd get done, go get breakfast, we'd go have a cup of coffee, whatever it was, and we were friends. Um, so I think silver co civil conversations are uh, important and good and enjoyable and we don't want to avoid them. And I don't think that's what you, you know, your, your podcast, I listened to a few of the episodes and scrolled through, you don't avoid difficult conversations and bringing together people who truly, truly disagree and trying to hash it out. So I respect you for, for doing that and doing it well. I'm going to leave it there. I appreciate you, uh, the fact that you listen to some of those and, and uh, recognize that's what I'm trying to do. And, 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 and uh, as I said before, I'm gratified that, when you sort of set the ground rules and say, can we all come into this conversation um, agreeing to be civil, to listen to each other uh, and, and then really enter into a deep, meaningful conversation about important, complicated topics uh, is a really important thing to do. Um, and so I come away from this conversation, Daniel, thinking that you and I probably agree that healthy conflict is better than toxic conflict. So Daniel, thanks so much for being part of the podcast today. Yeah, thanks for having me on. It's been a, been a pleasure. So to our listeners, I want to thank you for tuning in. You can find this in all of our episodes about having civil, courageous, and hopefully fruitful conversations about our schools at schoolconversations.com org and on your favorite podcasting platforms. You will also find some additional episode notes and some links to additional readings on this topic on our website. Again, that website is schoolconversations.org. So long, everyone.